and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. Today's episode, as you may have guessed, is a special episode, and we are going to be discussing the current Russian invasion of the Ukraine. For those of you listening to this show in the future, hello, future people. Uh, this is February of 2022. Now, normally on Relevant History, we talk about historical events, things that happened way in the past. I generally avoid anything that happened in the last 25 years or so. That said, this is relevant history. It is about historical events that are relevant to today's modern world, that have some sort of significant impact. And what is going on in the Ukraine, in turn, is relevant to the main sequence episodes we're doing right now, the episodes on Russia, specifically Siberia, but we got into a lot of Russian history. All of this to say, I wanted to give my quick thoughts on the situation. If you're not interested in that kind of thing, if you're interested more in the narrative history we usually do here, go ahead and tune out. I will not be offended. We will be back very shortly with your regularly scheduled programming, part two of Go East, Young Man, Go East. But for today we're going to look at some current events. And these events are very much on theme with what we are talking about in our show's first season. Nationalism. On the one hand, we have the traditional imperial ambitions of the Russian Empire. On the other hand, we have the unique national identity of the Ukrainian people and their struggle to remain independent. On those same lines, before we really get into the meat of things, let me express my deepest sympathy to the Ukrainian people. Sorry about what you guys are going through right now, and I wish you all the best. That being said, let's get on with things. I want to do four things in today's episode. First off, I want to talk about Vladimir Putin's motives for the war. Why is he doing this? Why is he attacking Ukraine? Number two, I want to outline the run-up to the war. Right, The recent events of the past couple of decades, and then ask the question, why now? Why right this second? Why February 2022 and not some other time? Number three, I want to ask what we should be looking for on the battlefield. We will go over some things that we should be watching for over the coming days and weeks as this conflict progresses. Finally, number four, I want to speculate about Putin's end goals for the war, or more broadly, how the war might turn out. This sort of prediction is a dangerous game, but we can look at several different possibilities. So, number one. Why is Vladimir Putin attacking the Ukraine and trying to eat up its territory? Well, uh, he tells us, doesn't he? He has told us. He told us on February 21st in his speech outlining the causes of the conflict. And what Putin says, what he believes, is that Ukraine is part of Russia's, quote, spiritual space, unquote. It is an inherently Russian land, and he also says that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest disaster of the 20th century. When you think about 
all of the disasters, the wars, and so on in the 20th century, that's a pretty strong statement to say that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the worst thing that happened. And Putin also pulls an interesting rhetorical trick. I don't know that it's really a trick, but he blames the Communist Party for carving up the Russian Empire and using nationalist movements to maintain power. So are these claims true? Well, in terms of being part of Russia's spiritual space, right, a traditional part of Russia, well, if you look at a map, Ukraine and Russia are different countries, aren't they? But the history there is very much tied together. In last episode, we talked about the origins of the Russian people, the Kievan Rus. Kiev, for centuries, was the heartland of Russian territory, and it wasn't until much later that that sort of focus shifted to Moscow. But that said, this is really only the case for the eastern part of Ukraine, right, from Kiev eastward. Everything west of that was never part of anything remotely Russian until the end of World War I. Until that time, those territories were part of either the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth or one of the other Central European powers. What about the breakup of the Soviet Union? Was that a communist mistake? Well, obviously it was, but what I meant to say, the breakup of the Russian Empire. Right? How do the communists play into that? Well, obviously they did literally overthrow the Tsar, right? Uh, they literally ended the Russian Empire and started the Soviet Union. And during the process, they did have to make some concessions. See, there were nationalist revolutions in parts of the old empire going on at the same time as the famous fight between the red communist side and the white czarist side, right? Uh, and in order to win that larger civil war, the communists did make some concessions to local nationalist groups, and that is how you got the Ukrainian SSR, the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. And when the Soviet Union breaks up, that Ukrainian SSR votes to become a separate country. So some of that territory was traditionally part of the Russian Empire, some of it was not. And this will become important to remember when we talk about Putin's endgame. One of the things that Putin talks about is the trend of Russian weakness from the breakup of the Soviet Union forward. Right. Russia had a terrible economic time of it in the 90s while NATO expanded and accepted a bunch of Eastern European former Soviet states into the NATO alliance, and Putin sees this as aggression. But to understand why, it's important to understand that Putin does not see these little countries in Eastern Europe joining NATO as a defensive move on their part. Right? He sees it as aggression on the part of NATO and specifically the United States. Now, why would he think that? It seems twisted from a Western point of view, but you have to think about things from the old Russian and uh, Eurasian tradition, right? the tradition of spheres of influence. When you have a large country like Russia, the Soviet Union, the Russian Empire, you 
have a lot of borders to defend. And in Russia's case in particular, in the case of a lot of uh, Central Asia and even parts of Northeast Asia, you don't have a lot of natural barriers between countries. And what this means is that it's very hard to defend these borders. So traditionally, a lot of these countries have had neighboring puppet states, right? buffer states between them and any potential enemies. The buffer states are a defensive ring around the more powerful country. And what Putin sees with NATO's expansion is the removal of those buffer states. And he sees the U.S. as acquiring uh, areas to potentially stage an offensive attack. Now, again, why would he think that? Well, because that's how the Russians have always thought. If you look back to negotiations with Poland in the 1930s, right, in the run-up to World War II, Poland and the Western allies, France and Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, they are having a security conference. And they're trying to come up with plans to defend against Adolf Hitler. And Stalin... Uh, is insisting on the Poles allowing Soviet troops to have access to Polish territory. Now, his argument is, uh, Poland, you're between us and Germany. If we're going to help you in a war against Germany, our troops need to get there. They need to cross your territory, otherwise any of this is pointless. And the Polish argument, of course, is, well, yeah, the Red Army may enter Poland to defend it from Germany and then just decide to never leave, so no thank you. And in the background, uh, Russian negotiators are talking with the British and the French, uh, trying to convince them to make Poland allow Soviet troops to pass through. And when you read about these conversations, these Soviet diplomats just don't seem to understand that France and Great Britain can't make the Polish do anything. They can strongly suggest it, and they do, but the Polish are really an independent country, and they really do make their own decisions. Right? The Soviets didn't get that. And I don't know that Putin gets that either about some of these countries in Eastern Europe. He does not understand that they have joined NATO defensively of their own free will. This must be the act of some larger power, the U.S. And in terms of this particular invasion, Putin has also made some more specific claims, which are a little bit absurd. Right? He says that Ukraine is committing genocide against the Russian minority. That is patently not true. Uh, although the government does promote the Ukrainian language, a lot of countries do that. France promotes the French language. Uh, the other specific claim Putin makes is that the government are neo-Nazis. Now, this is a common ploy in Russian propaganda when there's trouble. Uh, the bad guys are oftentimes painted as Nazis. When you think of the fact that Russia suffered so terribly under the Nazi invasion not all that long ago, you could understand why there's a strong cultural fear of that ideology taking root in a neighboring country. But here's the thing. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was elected on a peace platform, and also he's Jewish. And also, Ukraine lost millions of people in World War II to the Nazis as well. So the idea that a Ukrainian Jew is secretly a neo-Nazi, that's like accusing Al Sharpton of being a secret member of the KKK. It, it, it doesn't even compute. So, you know, in terms of any of that, he's, he's way off base. 
as I expect he knows he is. Right? Remember, this is propaganda. So what is the more recent history here, right? Moving on to the second thing I wanted to talk about today. Why is Putin attacking Ukraine right now, right this second? The two countries actually had mostly friendly relations after the Cold War and Ukrainian independence. And that would continue until 2014, when the old Moscow-backed government is overthrown by a series of street protests and a new, more democratic regime comes into place. Now, at that point, uh, Russia decides to invade and seize the Crimean Peninsula. Most of you probably remember that. The Crimea has a major Russian naval port, the base at Sevastopol. And this is Russia's only base on the Black Sea, Russia's only warm-weather base, and it's a major strategic asset. So as soon as there is no longer a compliant government in Kiev, as soon as there is risk that this Russian naval base might be asked to leave, Putin takes that territory. And he also uses special forces disguised as local insurgents to stage an insurgency in a small stretch of eastern Ukraine. And ever since then, there has sort of been a simmering, stagnant uh, front line there. There is a war, but not a whole lot of fighting, not a whole lot changed. But then... In 2020, an opportunity begins to arise. Putin is an opportunist. What is this opportunity? Well, it takes shape slowly. On August 9th, 2020, a guy named Lukashenko, the dictator of Belarus, wins a disputed election. He's always been able to pull off wins so far, but this one is so obviously fake that the people of Belarus start rioting, there are mass protests, and he barely maintains control of his government. Then, shortly thereafter, in April of 2021, there is an attempted coup by some senior Belarusian military leaders, and this coup attempt is foiled with Russian help. Shortly thereafter, Lukashenko invites Russian troops into the country for drills. This is mutually beneficial for both dictators. Lukashenko needs Putin to control his military. Clearly, he almost lost power to a coup, And meanwhile, Putin needs a buffer state, which is what Belarus is. It sits between Russia and Poland. He doesn't want to see Lukashenko go. There might be a democracy right next to him, a real one. And now long-term plans for a union of Belarus and Russia are finally becoming realized. This is an idea that dates back all the way to 1997, that the two states will sort of be a partnership, not quite a single country, but close. And now there are concrete steps being taken in that direction, most importantly in the military. Just before the invasion of Ukraine, the command and control aspects of the Belarusian and Russian militaries are integrated. So you still have separate Russian and Belarusian units, but for all intents and purposes, if the two countries were going to go to war together, well, 
they would be completely integrated. More importantly, though, having all of these troops on Belarusian soil gives Putin an opportunity he didn't have back in 2014. If you look at Ukraine on a map, the capital, Kiev, is way up in the north. It's just south of the Belarusian border. So if Putin can attack south out of Belarus at the same time as attacking out of the east, he might be able to take the capital city really quickly and knock Ukraine out of the war. That is my answer as to why now. That is my thinking, is he had opportunity. He had access to the area where he could put troops in position and pull off this invasion much more easily than he could have done if all of those troops had to come directly out of Russia. Again, just my theory. There are other theories. I have read from a couple of Ukrainian sources that one of the drivers for the invasion may have been the Ukrainian government's decision in February of last year to shut down a bunch of pro-Russian TV stations. These stations allowed Putin to sort of control the situation in the Ukraine with propaganda and with the shutdown of those stations, he had much less influence in Ukraine. And as the theory goes, this causes him to freak out and is the last straw and is the driver for the attack. Again, that's just another theory. If you really want to know why now, you'll have to hope that Putin writes his memoirs at some point so that we can find out. Regardless of the exact reasons, as we know, on February 24th, 2022, as I sit here speaking two days ago, a full-on invasion begins. Troops come in from the east to seize control not just of the disputed regions ruled by the supposed insurgents, but also more of eastern Ukraine. They're pushing in further. Troops come from north in Belarus, down directly towards Kiev. Troops come into the south from Crimea. And there's also a naval blockade on Ukraine's Black Sea coast. There may even have been some amphibious landings of Marines. That is unclear as things will continue to be as this war progresses. Remember, we are two days into the conflict. Everything we are hearing is new. It is garbled, and oftentimes it is incorrect. But what we do see two days into the war is a Ukraine that is completely surrounded. The only safe areas are far in the east. I'm sorry, far in the west near the borders with Poland, Romania, and Moldova. So much for why now. Moving on to the third thing I wanted to talk about today. What should we be looking for on the battlefield? What should we expect? What things are going to indicate that this fight is going one way or the other? And before we talk about this, let me just say I don't mean to be callous. Sometimes when you talk about the more technical aspects of war, it sounds like you are numb to the human aspect, and I'm not. But I do have a Patreon show about military history. I'm that kind of guy specifically military tactics and strategy, and you should subscribe. There's a link in the episode description. Anyway, all of this to say that if you're going to understand what's going on, it is important to talk about some of the technical aspects as well as many of the human aspects. The Russian invasion of Ukraine 
is the first large-scale war in the world since the Iran-Iraq War. Yes, there have been wars, but the U.S. invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan were small and unbalanced, and the civil wars in the Middle East really did not have the kinds of troop numbers that we are talking about here in Ukraine. In other words, everything since the Iran-Iraq War of the 1970s and 80s has either been too asymmetrical or too small-scale to tell us a whole lot about what the next big war might look like. And make no mistake, military leaders and experts from around the world are watching very closely, not just to see who wins and by how much, but also to see how a lot of these modern weapon systems work in practice. This is something that has been common throughout history. One good example is the U.S. Civil War. U.S. Civil War fought in the 1860s. At the time, there had not been any major wars in Europe since the Napoleonic Wars. The artillery and the rifles had made a lot of advancements. It was going to change how a large-scale war looked. So when the U.S. Civil War breaks out, what happens? Officers from every major European power are right there with the U.S. Army, sometimes with the Confederate Army, too, observing how the battles play out, seeing how this new technology changes the battlefield. Right? So far, they've only been able to use this stuff either in colonial wars or in military practice drills and tests, right? Not in actual combat. And a lot of times, no matter how much you drill and how much you test things, weapons systems do not perform in combat as expected. And what makes this new war a little bit unique is that we are all watching today via social media, if we want to. I am constantly getting videos from various friends showing things that are going on in Ukraine. You can go to some casting sites and see what they call multicasts with a whole bunch of webcams from around Ukraine and various news sites and ticker feeds. It looks like you're in the uh, situation room at the White House. It's pretty wild. We are all... Getting a front row seat to these events, thanks to modern technology. One of the new weapon systems, relatively new, that people are going to be watching is the U.S.-made Javelin anti-tank missile. A lot of these have been provided to the Ukrainian armed forces, and as we know... The Russians love their tanks. They have more tanks than anybody in the world, and it's not even close. They have armored personnel carriers as well, and lots of armor. Lots and lots of armor. And the Ukrainians only have about a third as many tanks. And that's not going to go well in a straight fight. They're going to need to use these anti-tank missiles to whittle down these Russian tanks. So how good are these missiles in practice? And can the U.S. deliver more? Again, Ukraine is cut off from easy ways to make a delivery. You'd have to send stuff in through a neighboring friendly country like Romania and then send it in to the defenders overland. It's not something that's going to happen in the next day or two. And 
if the U.S. and other Western powers deliver more aid, is that just limited to anti-tank missiles? Or do they also start sending things like Stinger anti-air missiles? Those could be very helpful. And for everything the Western powers may send or everything the Ukrainians might have of their own, we also need to see, do the Russians have effective countermeasures? On the Russian side, they have been talking a lot about hypersonic missiles. These are missiles that fly many times the speed of sound, so you can't intercept them with traditional uh, anti-air defenses. Right? By the time your radar has locked on to target the missile, it's already past you. These are very dangerous in theory, but as any of you Gulf War fans will know, missiles don't always perform as advertised. Saddam Hussein launched a whole lot of Scud missiles. As far as I know, uh, only one of them actually hit its target. I'm going off the cuff here. Uh, but the point being, uh, if these missiles are not accurate, if they're not consistently hitting what they're targeted at, then this is a very expensive weapons system that the Russians have wasted a lot of money on, and it takes away a lot of their perceived edge. Another thing to look for is the usage of drones. Now, I'm not talking about the big drones uh, like the U.S. has been using for a long time. We've seen plenty of drone uh, action over the past couple of decades, but a couple of years ago, in 2022, there was a border conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. This was over the small disputed district of Nagorno-Karabakh. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Anyway, in this conflict, there were a lot of drones, also a lot of ground conflict, but one of the things... One of the main things that gave Azerbaijan a big edge and allowed them to win was their usage of kamikaze quadcopters. I kid you not, these are quadcopters that are rigged up with explosives, and you can send them to an area where you think there are enemy troops or where some, you know, an enemy tank may be about to go by. And you just have that quadcopter hang around in the area, and when you see something you can target, you drop the quadcopter on it. And this was incredibly effective and cheap, and it drove the Armenians absolutely batty because you could be trying to reinforce a frontline position, and instead of another attack on the front line, instead a bunch of these exploding quadcopters drop on your reinforcements. Right? These are little crazy technologies that are very modern, very new. I haven't seen anything about these little drones being used in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but it is early yet. And you could see some wild new technology like that come in and change the game. As far as a broader strategic perspective goes, though, I think the current question is, can the Ukrainians hold their capital city of Kiev? It is a big deal if a country loses its capital. Wars have been lost because of the loss of a capital. If you are... Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, it is critical to hold this city if at all possible. Now, can the Ukrainians do that? Right now, the situation is fluid. It's tough to predict. The Russians have not been attacking by day. They've been you know, shelling and launching missiles at important targets, and instead they have been trying to infiltrate by night with special forces and people disguised as civilians, and uh, the fighting has been low-level in the streets, mostly 
with soldiers catching uh, small Russian units trying to sneak into the city and pushing them back out. Now, this is, again, a developing situation. It is very tough to predict. By the time this episode hits the air, it will be probably around 11 p.m. in Ukraine. There could be a renewed Russian assault. My words could be meaningless by the time they reach your ears. In addition, there is still Russian armor massing north of Kiev, so it could always be the case that there is still a massive attack coming, that these are just sort of probing motions. Again, we're only two days into the war. Putin doesn't have to be in a hurry, necessarily. Another factor to look at is the human factor. It's, this can sometimes be more important than numbers or technology, right? A people's will to fight. When the invasion kicked off, I made a prediction on Twitter. I said that the Ukrainian state would collapse by the end of March and that whatever was left would be a Rup Russian puppet. I said that because I expected there to be very limited resistance. I thought that the Ukrainian army and civilian population would crack under the initial invasion, much like the Iraqi armed forces cracked under the U.S. invasion in 2003. Well, as it turns out, I may have been wrong. There seems to be a pretty stiff resistance from the military. They have been losing ground in some areas, but uh, they've also been surprisingly effective. I've, I've been surprised at how slowly the Russian advance has moved. Let's look at a few examples while we're looking at the human element of this fight. Things that indicate a strong will to fight. Now, some of these stories may only be Ukrainian government propaganda. You never know. It is wartime. Countries like to talk up any potential heroes to inspire the people, but some of the things we've seen just in the first 24 hours, I'm sorry, 48 hours, well, they've been pretty inspiring. For example, there was a bridge between the Crimea and the mainland in southern Ukraine, and seeing that there were Russian forces about to cross, the Ukrainians needed to mine the bridge, and a young engineer successfully rigged the mines, but the Russians had come too close. He wasn't going to be able to set a charge and then get out of there. So he blew up the bridge with himself still on it rather than allow the Russians to cross. And this successfully delayed the Russian advance by several hours and allowed the Ukrainians to organize their troops a little bit better and make a response. If this story is true, this man is a national hero. There's a video going around of a lady in part of Ukraine, handing out packets of sunflower seeds to Russian troops who are walking through her city, and she tells them to keep a few in their pockets so that flowers will grow after they die on Ukrainian soil. How about the 13... Ukrainian military personnel at a naval base in the Black Sea who refused to surrender. And I apologize. I try to keep this show PG, but this is actually what happened. This is history. Uh, the Russian military vessel transmits a radio message. Uh, Ukrainian base surrender. And the Ukrainian base responds to the Russian ship 
Russian warship, go fuck yourself. And following that, it is unclear what happened. Some reports say that the men were all shelled to death. Some say that there was some shelling and they later surrendered. Anyway, it's not exactly remember the Alamo, but uh, got some sloganeering going on here earlier in the war. This is inspiring for the Ukrainian people. How about the story of Yarina Arieva and Sviatoslav Forsen? This is a young couple who were supposed to get married in May, but instead they got married right away, picked up their guns, and joined the fight with volunteers. There's an 80-year-old grandfather who tried to enlist. There are local volunteers with armbands all over the country. There was a Russian paratroop assault, I believe southeast of Kiev, on a military base, and it wasn't just Ukrainian troops who fought them off. It was a bunch of these local volunteers. So far, so good. Seems like a stiff defense. Seems like maybe the Russians bit off more than they could chew, but that could change very quickly if the capital falls, if Kiev falls. And there is also the wild card of Prime Minister Volodymyr Zelensky. As many of you probably know, he has decided to stay in the capital and fight with his people. And he's periodically live-streaming from there on his phone to show people that the government is still in control of the city and you know, the buses are still running on time and all that. And this is good for morale. It's good for the people. It is inspiring to see a leader with that kind of backbone and who is leading by example. In the early morning this morning, in fact, the U.S. made an offer, supposedly. I have to keep saying supposedly because all of this is breaking news and this is why I hate current events because... A lot of times it turns out that something didn't happen or it didn't happen the way people said it happened. Or Anyway, supposedly early this morning, uh, the U.S. made an offer to help Vladimir Zelensky evacuate from Kiev, begging him to get to a safer position. And he said, quote, the fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride, unquote. Talk about drama. If this defense of Kiev is successful, if the attempted Russian invasion ends in embarrassment, Zelensky is going to get a monument built in his honor. I don't mean like some little statue either. I mean like the Lincoln Memorial or the Washington Monument type monument. It's that kind of historical moment, and it's happening right now. Regardless, something to watch. Something to watch. If Zelensky is captured, that right there achieves a lot of the Russian war aims, which is to overthrow the government in part. Moving back to the Russian side... It's also important to watch what Putin does if resistance is unexpectedly stiff. Does he threaten to kill the families of Ukrainian troops who don't surrender? Does he employ massive thermobaric bombs, devastating huge urban areas, potentially? Does he shell populated areas? He's already quote-unquote, accidentally hit some civilian buildings. It's bound to happen again. Does he use nukes? He has hinted that he would be willing to do so if any outside powers intervened. Why not simply drop a few of them on Ukrainian defensive positions to soften up the Ukrainians? Unlikely, it's probably just saber-rattling, but he could do it. 
And finally, is there a backlash within Russia? Now, obviously, Putin is a dictator. He is not beholden to voters, but dictators are overthrown from time to time. If people get angry enough, you never know what might happen. And understand that the Russian state media is controlled, but there's not a great firewall there like there is in China. Right? Russians can still access international media. They can also access things like Telegram for sharing information. So unlike in some dictatorships where information is entirely restricted, the Russian people have some ability to learn what is going on. Right? We've already seen some small protests, and those were broken up. But what if... 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 body bags come back to Russia. Do you see an upswelling of anger on the street that could force Putin's hand? Moving on to the fourth thing I wanted to talk about today what does Putin want? Right. Assuming that Ukraine's defenders are eventually overwhelmed, how far does he take things? Well, let's look at his declaration of war. What he says in his speech declaring war is that he wants to defend the Russian ethnic people in Donbass. And by the way, if you haven't read or listened to Putin's speech, I highly encourage you to do so. It is very informative if you are trying to get inside his head. Anyway, he says that he wants to defend the Russian ethnic people in Donbass. Right? This is the area in eastern Ukraine that was semi-liberated, if you will, by local insurgents and Russian special forces acting as insurgents, right? This is a small area along the border. But in his speech, he also claims all of Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, right? These are, those are basically like states in Ukraine, or provinces, if you will. He claims two entire provinces that you know, this Donbass area is part of. So he claims a whole bunch more territory, and he says all of that is part of the independent Donbass Republic. And he did give himself some wiggle room. See, what he says is that he will, quote, demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. What does that mean? Those are slippery terms. And this is such a Putin thing to do. Because depending on how you define those terms, he has a number of possible ways to claim victory. Always important, even if you lose a war, to be able to convince your people that you actually won it. So, assuming that we're rooting for Ukraine here, what are these scenarios, right? What's the best case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? And what else could possibly happen? Well, the best case scenario is that the Ukrainians continue to stand. The Russians do not advance very far into Ukrainian territory. These defensive weapons like anti-tank missiles turn out to be highly effective, and the Russian body count rises, and Angry Russians are rioting in the streets, and even the people in the security services are starting to get upset. And this starts to threaten Putin's political standing at home. Well, at that point, all he has to do is declare victory and go home. He can say that it was a struggle, but Ukraine was demilitarized. After all, there's been this bombing campaign and all of these missiles, and 
We destroyed a whole bunch of their infrastructure and command and control and some of their bases and knocked out some of their uh, industry that could be used for military purposes. In mission success. Fortunately for Ukraine in this situation, at least their country is intact. Now, the next possible scenario is that the war slowly goes against Ukraine but Russian costs in, in lives and material, more importantly, I think Putin cares much more about material than lives, but Russian costs start to get too high and both sides want a way out. So then Putin demands formal recognition of the Donbass Republic and formal recognition of Russian ownership of Crimea. Then he goes home and declares victory. He says to the Russians, we have demilitarized the Ukraine and we have successfully defended the ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine. Mission success. Moving on to a slightly more extreme scenario. Things go like they did before, but in addition to requiring Ukraine to recognize the Donbass Republic and Russian Crimea, there is also going to be a change of government, and Ukraine is now a puppet state. This, I think, is probably the most likely scenario, especially if Zelensky is captured. I, th I think you do see the government fall. But I could be wrong. Anyway, in this case... Same as before, Putin goes home and declares victory, right? achieved all his territorial aims. He neutered the Ukrainian military, and by installing a puppet state, he has also fulfilled his pledge to quote-unquote denazify Ukraine. Another more extreme scenario. Same thing, except the Russians take everything east of the Dnepr River. Now, the Dnepr River is a north-south river that flows right through the middle of Ukraine and divides it neatly into east and west. The east side has a lot of ethnic Russians. The west side has almost none. So in this case, Russia gets all of the significant Russian ethnic population in Ukraine, all of this land up to the Dnepr River, which is a fairly easily defensible border, and they also get the city of Kiev, the spiritual heart of old Russia. And then they install a puppet regime in the Ukraine. But there are scenarios where people think Putin might go even further. Uh, for example, what if he wants to completely and utterly bring Ukraine to its knees? Well, he could conquer the entire Black Sea coast, couldn't he? He could go all the way to Moldova in the West. And this would leave the new Ukrainian puppet state completely landlocked, unable to receive supplies by sea, and it would also allow the Russians to seize the major Black Sea port of Odessa. And this scenario would also leave the road open to further expansion. See, there's a little strip of territory in Moldova called Transnistria. Now, Transnistria is part of Moldova, but there is a rebel group that controls the area, and they claim that they want to be part of Russia. Well, if Russia extends all the way down the Black Sea coast to Moldova, there is no reason that they can't just finish off their campaign by linking up with Transnistria and officially recognizing it as part of Russia. And what is tiny little Moldova, little officially neutral Moldova, going to do about it? And 
who is going to care? Now, in all of these scenarios, there is still something called Ukraine left over afterwards. This is for a couple of reasons. One, I don't think Putin wants to deal with the trouble of controlling Western Ukraine. I don't think he wants to deal with the guerrilla war, and you would probably have to deal with that in the western part of the country, where there are virtually no ethnic Russians, right? And furthermore, that western area would be a buffer state, right? It would be a buffer between Putin and the rest of Europe. Either way, unlikely, but it could happen. Crazier things have come to pass. Putin may try to conquer all of Ukraine, just like Hitler conquered all of Czechoslovakia just before World War II. Speaking of World War II, a lot of people have been talking about World War III, and I don't think that that's what we're looking at here. There is not going to be a direct conflict between the U.S. and Russia over Ukraine because nobody would be crazy enough to do that. But I did just compare Ukraine to Czechoslovakia, didn't I? And World War II did not begin with the conquest of Czechoslovakia. It took a little while longer, didn't it? It took until the Nazi regime invaded Poland, and that was a bridge too far. So, if you want to talk about a potential World War III scenario, imagine that Putin takes most or all of Ukraine, and shortly thereafter absorbs Belarus when The dictator Lukashenko has an unfortunate accident. Well, that puts Russia in historic territory, back in control of most of the old Russian empire, but it puts Russia in another historical territory as well. The German invasion of Poland at the beginning of World War II was ostensibly over the issue of East Prussia. This piece of German territory that was separated from the rest of Germany by the Polish corridor. Well, there is right now in Eastern Europe a small Russian enclave, basically a city called Kaliningrad on the Baltic coast. If there is indeed a Russian-Belarusian union, that union will be just slightly separated from Kaliningrad by a little strip of Lithuania. And unlike Ukraine, Lithuania is a NATO member. The other members of the NATO alliance are bound by treaty to defend Lithuania if she is attacked. Would the public in the Western countries support a war with Russia to defend a country roughly the size of West Virginia? Would they just let Putin take that little stretch of territory and connect Kaliningrad with the rest of Russia? I don't know, but it's something that Putin might gamble on. And if he gambles, that's how you get World War III. But hey, at least we can all live stream it. Thanks for listening. Yeah.
guess who? It's me again, Dan, and I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive. The link for the Relevant History Patreon is in the description, and the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. By the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests for those Patreon videos. Of course, not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. But if you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones, but eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. You can also reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds as well as my blog, which I have not updated in ages, but eh, you never know. You can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.